The House of the Lord Church in Brooklyn, New York has been a touchstone for activist leaders to meet for the last 50 years. And welcoming everyone from Nelson Mandela to Betty Shabazz has been the Daughtry family, who've shone a light from this community church on local and global issues, from civil rights to apartheid. Today, Leah Daughtry, who rose to political fame as the only person to twice be the CEO of the Democratic National Convention, gave me a tour of the faith and the fight that's so ingrained in this place. This is a family business, essentially, right? Our church has been uh, an activist church from our founding and with my grandfather in 1929. So we've always been really engaged and focused on the needs of the community mm -hmm. and how our faith uh, informs us to uh, terms of our actions in those moments. We've been involved in movements around tr things like Trayvon Martin or around police abuse of power for decades. And over in that corner, there's actually one of the first major rallies we did when Arthur Miller was killed in 1978. How old were you then? Uh, I was 15. It's kind of an amazing thing to think that you grew up around your heroes. Yes, yes. I mean, how do you stay grounded? How does that, you know, <laughs> how does that make you feel when you, when you know that you can recall, oh yeah, you know, I remember when Winnie Mandela was here. Yeah, uh, when you've been able to sit at a table with Stokely Carmichael mm. while he's eating dinner, yeah. <laughs> or Betty Shabazz or John Lewis or any of them, and they come through these walls and through these doors and you have an opportunity to have a real conversation with them. You know, it, it keeps your feet on the ground. You've had the chance to interact. Mm. You've had the chance to see them in in private moments. You've had the chance to discuss with them and to hear what they're thinking and how they're thinking. And so when you do that, then the, how big can your head be? <laughs> <laughs> so true, that's so true. Well, I mean, show me some more of these as well, especially, and I have to try and kind of ground myself when I'm talking to you about this because, you know, we're standing behind some of these amazing, amazing moments in history yes, as well. Yes, like yes, yes, yes. The Pope, Mandela, I mean, you know, tell, tell, talk to me about some of these moments. Absolutely. Here. Do you remember it, any of yeah, these very Yeah, absolutely. Potently? This, of course, uh, my father, who's pictured here, was uh, part of the Jackson campaigns in 1984 and 1988, and they went to visit the Pope in Rome at the Vatican, and he accompanied Reverend Jackson, and those are J Reverend Jackson's sons. And of course, when Mr. Mandela and Mrs. Mandela came to New York after Mandela was freed, uh, my father was part of the planning committee, and actually Mrs. Mandela came here to our church uh, to speak. We had been very active in the anti-apartheid movement for years, since the 70s. And so when they became uh, emancipated, we were right there on the spot. And of course, our Sisters Against South African Apartheid is an organization that my mom founded. Mm. And we provided material support and other kinds of aid to the, to the people of South Africa during the apartheid era. I mean, how did that feel? I mean, you were so involved, your whole family was so involved mm -hmm. in the apartheid movement. How did it feel when you met Winnie Mandela for the first time? My goodness. Well, you know, we'd done it for so long. We were one of the few places that were talking about the apartheid movement. That was in the, in the early 70s. The day that Mandela was released, we, uh, it was a Sunday. We stopped the service. We put a television on the altar so everyone could watch because we didn't know what time he was getting out. We just knew he was getting out. And when he came out, we were all in the sanctuary group around this television. Everybody's trying to see. And he, we saw him walk out. There was a minute of our Sunday service. We just wow. suspended service. And then we was just this cheer of jubilation. And then people just poured out into the street. And all along Atlantic Avenue, you could see people in the street dancing and, uh, and, and just in praise for the, for the moment. So when they finally came here, after all the time of us doing all this work and Mrs. Mandela, it was, it was just this awe-filled moment because you'd read about her, you'd seen her on television. We'd had messages exchanged, but we hadn't met her. And she, she came here, she was so gracious, so wonderful. It was just a singular moment in my life to just see this, this woman who was so bigger than life mm -hmm. now standing you know, as close as you and I are. Among the many familiar faces on these walls are Leah's parents, Reverend Herbert and Dr. Karen Daughtry, who've led global movements from this Brooklyn community church, and they've made activism a family activity. You see these amazing figures in history, but at the time, and, and still now, there were obviously struggles, and it was political, and people died, and you know, you're, you're, how did it feel to, to raise a child in a space where there was conflict constantly? Well, we kind of maybe trained them for any eventuality. 
They were on the marches, the demonstrations. When she was a little girl, I used to take her to the UN. We were very much a part of coordinated the Free Mandela Movement. Everybody went to jail. You know, I told them that we all go into jail together. So Leah is a jailbird. I <laughs> <laughs> knew that there was some rebel somewhere. Yeah. There you go. Why did you feel like it was important for Leah to experience jail? Well, because it just was a part of the soil out of which we raised them. Most people would have thought they would not comprehend what was going on, but we were always talking about what was going on in the community, what was going on in the world. And therefore, this is, the, this is what they grew up eating dinner around, and there was a rule that you could not leave the table because maybe perhaps the discussions were boring to children that were maybe three, five, seven, and nine years old, but you could not leave the table unless you asked to be excused. And when you asked to be excused, if the discussion was not finished or the conversation was not finished, the answer was no. So you sat through all of the <laughs> discussions that perhaps he and I were having about what happened at his day, what happened at my day. And so I think that, that, that out of that soil, there became a hunger which took root. And so they grew up with, a, with an inquisitiveness. We used to have to read the New York Times. When we were kids, we started out by having to read one page of the New York Times and then two pages of the New York Times so that you understood not just what was happening in the community, but also around the world. How do you kind of explain to children and to young people growing up that progress is slow? I, th I think it was real to them and maybe a, a little easier in that the people they were reading about were here. <laughs> Bernie Sanders have mentioned that it's important to call out Donald Trump as a racist. He said it's important to kind of use that language and be very specific and blunt. Do you feel that that's necessary for the kind of current political moment? You know, I think that it is uh, important for every American, every person of goodwill to call out racism and sexism and all the phobias wherever they see it. Uh, and I think that's part of the truth telling and that we're looking for in the nation now. And I would encourage whoever's running, Democrat, Republican, I wanna see you tell the truth. I wanna see you stand against racism, against sexism, against homophobia, mm -hmm. against transphobia, all of those things. I wanna know that you're going to protect the least of these, that you're going to speak for those who are being mistreated and abused and who are being held outside of the American dream, the immigrant community. That's what I want to hear. And I don't think that's a challenge for Democrats alone. It's a challenge for all of us. Do you feel the same way? I mean, especially when we're around the, the photos of history, you know, all these people that were speaking out and were speaking out in ways and in times when it wasn't necessarily popular. I, I uh, share Leah's feelings. I think that this has been a lonely journey because perhaps now maybe people are more willing to speak out because of the situation in our nation at the moment. But this whole uh, room, all of this history was lonely at the time, for, especially for the Reverend who was leading the charge, uh, who, was, who was speaking truth to power and was being isolated by others who, were might, who might have been afraid to do so at the time. So I, I totally agree. Uh, that this is the time that people need to speak up and to say what is correct and what is right. That's the prophetic tradition to speak truth to power. So um, obviously I'm political enough to agree with my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> completely uh, with what she has indicated. But with respect to the loneliness and the pain, you know, there's something um, something mysterious and deep about the commitment of oneself to a cause that is bigger than one. There's a deep fulfillment that my life is committed to a cause to make the world better mm -hmm. for all people.